Hello and welcome back to part four of our interview with Omar Cater and Nancy Stowe. Good Stowe. job, Stowe. Stowe? Stowe. Stowe Cater. Um, we have talked about a bunch of great stuff and we're going to finish by talking about their faith journeys. So Omar, let's start with you. Um, you know, as I think back to sort of episode one, part one, you were never really doctrinally, uh, spiritually even necessarily converted, at least at first. Talk a bit about your faith journey and your leadership sort of uh, ascent that then at some point kind of went awry. Just maybe give us a few minutes on that just so we can get a feel. Did you ever feel like you had a testimony? Did you ever pray for one? And talk about that. Um, when I first started, my, my main theme was family. How do I create a family that um, is unified in purpose, meaning do good things, uh, pursue excellence in ourselves, you know, big jihad, little jihad. How, how do we get to be better people? And how do we make the communities we live in a better place to live? Whether you do that, as an Episcopalian, a Protestant, or a Mormon, um, each individual finds their path. So I live in Utah, so the best way for me to improve my community is to be a Mormon. I had uh, joined the Masons a year or two before, and they were working really hard to make it a better community, but I, I think I was 21, 22, and the next guy was 60, and the guy after that was 70, 80. They were really nice folks, but it wasn't as active as I wanted. So I started to investigate it, and I ran into this guy named Ralph Woodward, who was the a cappella choir of BYU convert, a tremendous guy. We weren't terribly close, but we were friends. And, and his kids and others, and I mixed once in a while, that same. And one day at one of the meetings, I think we were at their house, he walked over to me and just said, I understand you're investigating the church. He says, I'm a convert too. And he says, let me just tell you, don't get your you know, head wrapped around the axle on every word and every doctrine and everything. It's a damn good way to live being a Mormon. He said, just keep that in mind. They're not trying to make you into a monster or anything else. And it was good advice. And he, then he went on to say, it makes your family happier, it keeps you unified. And so you start looking at the big picture, don't care about it. And when Benson gives you speeches, it's just so dissonant, so completely antagonistic to Jesus Christ and everything he stands for, forget it. It's, it's what Hugh Nibley did for me, it's what Hillam did, it's what the Archie Bowdens did, the great people of my life that helped me and showed me the way and emulated on how I should behave as I got along. So I decided not to pick and nitpick and just be as a faithful member without any pretenses of knowing anything. So I took it on faith. When I became a bishop, I had a couple of really unusual experiences. Some I prayed about and some were forced on me. And they were all positive. And my mind was constantly working on it. So how do I know where they came from? I don't argue. I just have my own private way of explaining it. There came a time when I realized that politics was too much a part of the Mormon church's agenda, and it mirrored the Republican Party. What they did on gays, what they did on women, what they did on intellectuals, the clumsy behavior of firing faculty, and I have talked to some of those that got fired, and I asked them, what in the world were you thinking when you went there? That they were going to let you win and corrupt the place? I mean, there are a million universities around the country, around the world. Why wouldn't you go someplace else and be that way? And every one of them answered the same way. I care about my church. I care about a school I went to, and I wanted to improve it. Well, the church isn't asking for help to run BYU. The church isn't asking for help in running the church. They're asking for you to do what you're supposed to be doing, and they'll tell you what you're supposed to be doing. So the final straw for me was, and it's always been, I tolerated the blacks. and I Really quickly, did I get the impression that you felt like you were kind of being groomed? 
for leadership in the church? I never, I never imagined. I thought he was. She did, and and some of what my made colleagues. You, what made you think that, Nancy? Um, because they asked him to do things in the Middle East, and they talked to him. You know, people would call him and conference with him about various subjects. It seemed to me that they were trying to see like high-level church leaders. Yeah, yeah regional 70s, reps and seventies and. And sometimes more. And meeting with the first presidency sometimes. Mm -hmm. But they were they were testing maybe to find out if I was fit. I, I, I never I knew I'd never fit. I, I, I was honest enough with them that I'm the wrong guy, I would tell them. Were you ever invited for callings higher than bishop? I counseled, but that's all. I counseled then okay. bishop. And then after Did that, you ever turn down callings or Yeah, I turned down bishop three or four times and on the high council. Okay. Why were you turning things down? I had a young family, and I hadn't finished my dissertation. Okay. okay. That's the, the only reason. Okay, okay. Never doctrinal. Okay. Anyway, in the end, um, I felt like an artificial Christian for being a faithful Mormon when they didn't give the priesthood to blacks. I was shamed by that. And when it was all over, I was disgusted and felt dirty for pretending that it was okay to exclude blacks from the priesthood because it was some really rotten personalities in very high positions that did it. They were racist and they were bigots, and there's no other way to put it. We're talking Peterson, Benson. Uh, Lots um, of them were in the shadows, up and down the whole thing. And then they had- Harold the, B. Lee. Yeah, and they had the whole religion department at BYU following. I mean, they indoctrinated a lot of people. And so you just remain quiet about it. And then you're ashamed of yourself for remaining quiet. And then they turn on the heat on the uh, gay, LGB, whatever, ABCQ. Um, and I listened to your presentation and others about the suicides and the rates and the harm they cause. And then I talked to my friends who had gay and lesbian children and how sad and sorrowful they were. And I was angry over it. I couldn't even be sad or sorrowful about it. I was angry that these people called themselves men of God and caused so much misery. And I thought it was peculiar that men of God stand up quietly and mock gays and lesbians for being phony or fake. Or I watched um, Boyd Packer mock gays and lesbians and gender. It was a disgusting it was at a conference when he did it. It was a disgusting performance. And I began to realize that I was uh, enabling. I was a co-conspirator. I was stupid for listening to it. Who do they think they are trying to get us to be stupid with them? And, and it was not about gays. We don't, I don't have any gay relatives that I know of. Not, and uh, you know, I, I've talked frankly about sexuality with my four sons, and they're all pretty normal guys, and I asked them what they think about it. And you know, every one of them came down the same way, and they say, you know, we're all born the way we are. I'm not saying that I was born to swear, I, you know, or, be, or cuss words, or be ignorant, or, you know. But you're not born to be stupid and, and a bigot when you say, I know you're different, and you don't have any right to be different. That's an ignorant statement. And so it's so out of bounds that uh, the lack of kindness, it's back when I wrote this in an article, in the dialogue article in the last few chapters, that when the church designates somebody as not a full Christian or a full human being, you're telling some nut somewhere that is similar to the kid that got Matthew Shepard up in Wyoming and beat him to death because he was gay. The, the church leadership is giving license to violence against gays, bigotry against gays. And uh, I have employees that are gay, and we, the law tells us what we can do and can't do. It's very explicit. And to be so blatantly illegal and demanding uh, freedom of religion in the name of bigotry is beyond my ability. So I didn't, it does not affect my faith in Jesus Christ one bit, or Muhammad, a prophet of Islam, one bit, or the Presbyterians who just took a vote on condemning Israel for confiscating land on the West Bank, a very gutsy thing. I have faith in Christians all over the world. 
When did your relationship with the church change from you being a bishop and holding callings? Or were you holding callings all through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s? When we moved. When we, when we moved? About 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years it started to go. When I saw people stand up. Okay, so conference. through 2000, whatever, you were active and yeah. holding callings. Gospel doctrine teacher. Gospel doctrine. All through. Uh -huh. All through 2000 something. Yeah. About 2004. Or Four or five. Okay, around the time Mormon story started, what happened? You know, there was a time when I realized <coughs> I couldn't kid myself anymore. These people weren't going to change. They were going to double down. They were going to be stupid and then double stupid. And, and I consider them outrageously stupid now. You cannot go out and tell the world when the world is finally passing laws to make it legal for people to live. I don't see this as a gay issue. I see this as a, a human right issue. It's a human right that the Mormon church is on the wrong side of. And not baptizing blacks was a, was a civil right that the Mormon church was on the wrong side of. And I knew who stood in the way of it. And when President uh, Kimball finally did it, I was proud that they finally did it, but it was too late. They'd done their damage. I'm not going to wait for them this time. I can't be a part of it. So I decided that I'd, I'd quit going, or I, I decided I promised her that I'd go every quarter at least once. <laughs> and I tried that for a year, year and a half, and then just one day said, that's it. So around 2005, 2006, you kind of stopped going. Yeah, the gay, the, the that was bugging you back then. Yeah, the human rights issue. It's a human right. That's all it is. I don't care about gay lies. I, my definition of a pervert is an over interest in other people's sex life. <laughs> Anybody that has an overly active interest in other people's sex life is a pervert. And if you want to get up there and talk about masturbation and talk about homosexuality, and talk about pornography over the pulpit of the only true church in the world, you go right ahead and do it, but do it without me. So, so they lost you then. So I, I decided, and I stay home on Sundays. We don't watch TV, we don't watch football, we read and talk, and we have the best family home evening in the world every Sunday, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> and it's, it's, we have a ritual, don't we? <laughs> yes. We get up, I make her breakfast, she, she thank reads. Thank you, thank you. I, I, read, I read the paper to her, mm -hmm. she reads the paper to me. Which paper? The Washington Post and the New York Times. And the Washington Times, a really right-wing, <laughs> rotten newspaper. <laughs> but I will have to say that uh, during this time of transition, he did blame me a little bit. He said, oh. um, because I was still going to church, but my you know beliefs were less. And he said, you dragged me into the church, and now are you going to drag me out? He felt like he was a pawn in my schemes, yeah. you know. Because you were nudging him out, or what? She didn't nudge me out. I didn't I, nudge him out exactly. But she, but but she quit and left me in. <laughs> <laughs> well, but kinda. but But it was... Well, you left before her, so how did that? Yeah, what do you mean? see. Kind of. It was, it was the, the actual beliefs, not the actual attendance that changed. I'll tell, oh, okay, you, okay. I'll tell you, it isn't the only thing that, that they got. I went, and every time I went, it was Republican, Republican, Republican. If I wanted to join the Republican Party, I don't need to be a Mormon. <laughs> I can go downtown D.C. to the national headquarters, pay my dues, and be a card-carrying Republican. Every Sunday at church, it was Republican hour. Even in Virginia? Even, especially in Virginia. Huh. Well, it's so common they're aware of it. I mean, we still have a home teacher, and we explained to him that we were tired of hearing Republican doctrines over the pulpit, and he had never heard that. He didn't believe that happened. He, they're not aware. They don't hear themselves. Well, didn't you, you know? hear so-and-so say such and such? You know? And, and <coughs> we have so special language for that. It right. doesn't take much. But anyway, was there ever a... You know, right now, the things people talk about are stone in the hat and the first vision, you know, multiple care. versions. I don't and care about it. That, that was never interesting to you. No, it was interesting, but it didn't bother me. It you was paid, never... I paid very little attention to that. I don't so pay attention to that. For you, it's the church's bigotry, stupidity, and the Republican... It's the Republican emphasis. Party Association and the obsession with perverted ideas. Okay. Yeah, that got, that got you. <laughs> You, you, you heard that before? <laughs> I was just saying, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay, Nancy, how about you? Now, you you stayed another 10 years, so your your departure from the church is recent. 
So talk to us about your faith journey. Well, I was, um, I was earlier, much earlier on him, I'm beginning to question. And mine was because of women's issues. And to tell you the truth, I feel a little differently than you guys. I'm a little mad that gays are so far ahead of us in getting their yeah, rights secured. And we course. women can't seem to organize. Oh, no. <laughs> women are behind gays. Yes. Yeah, it's crazy. For sure. and, you know, so... Um, so I was, I was beginning to question, you know, in the 80s, maybe even before. I was pretty literal when we got married. I, I wanted to get married in the temple because I literally wanted to be with him forever and all that. But, but we, we questioned everything all along. We'd come home from sacrament meeting and question everything. But anyway, um, yeah, so in the early 80s, I really... That's when I went on my reading spree, which I've mentioned, and really decided that... I read too many books. I, yeah, I, I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't go with it literally anyway. But I had no desire to quit entirely, and I have. I think people would be surprised if they knew how many other people like me were going to church quietly and not really believing. And I, you know, have some stalwart friends like that. And was so, your non-believing conscious to you? Yeah. Okay. Then it was, and and I was very much into the things you mentioned. I was paying very strong attention to whether the Book of Mormon was factually true and. You know, all those kinds of of issues were very concerning to me, and um, and I was surprised at how many people put up with the polygamy. When I first read about the many, many like Todd Compton and the many, many women and, and the young girls, I was dreadfully upset, and I couldn't believe how many women I knew were like, "Well, that's how men are, and it's to be expected." <laughs> just people are just willing to to take it anyway. So, but the difference was I didn't want to upset my family, and I didn't want to upset people I loved and the kids were growing up and it didn't seem like a good time and I made excuses. I loved playing the piano in primary for the little kids. Did you take callings where you had to say things you didn't believe? N no, I was, I'm, because I'm in music, it was pretty easy. I either played always... the piano in Relief Society or in primary. <laughs> yeah. Although some of the primary songs are pretty vicious. You yeah. Know? Follow the prophet. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's kind of upsetting. But anyway, um, and the reason Kate Kelly became a catalyst was not just Kate, although um, I couldn't believe my bishop because I knew him. If it hadn't been my ward and my bishop, maybe it wouldn't so have affected me. tell the listeners about your Kate and you and okay. your bishop. What, well, so, what does Kate have to do with you and your bishop? Okay. <laughs> well, for, I should say that we have a little group in our ward of Democrats. What's the ward? Um, it's the uh, Vienna Ward, Oakton State okay. in Virginia. And in that ward, we have probably... 10 families and in, in which somebody works on the hill or whatever and they're democrats and so every three or four months we would have a party and talk politics and they're mormons but it was strictly political and you know who are we voting for what are we going to do who should win whatever and um and when kate and her husband moved back there she was in showed up in our ward and I knew nothing about her except that she was a law student. And or I think she just finished law school at that time. Her husband was studying. And um, she seemed interesting. And then someone told me, hey, she's more radical than most of the others here. She's really libertarian. So we talked. And I just thought she was amusing and pretty smart. Um, I, I really... Kate, did you hear that? Pretty. She said pretty smart. Pretty smart. <laughs> pretty smart. <laughs> and I... Um, oh, and we actually, her parents stayed with us one year at Thanksgiving because they came to visit her and she didn't have a big apartment, you know, so we got to know them. They're really, really kind people. Her father gave me a lovely painting. Nice. Painting. Uh, really nice. And anyway, so we liked them. And so, um, so I guess I was kind of loyal to this group of people. And then I, I began to realize, oh, this is the Kate. I, she did something, and we all went, this is the same Kate Kelly that we're friends with, this Kelly out in Utah, because she was getting more press, of course, in Utah, we didn't realize. So I began to follow her saga just in After the After she had left? No. But the, oh, okay. You know, how, oh, when, when she came here to do she, that yeah. action. Okay. Well, Right, and so in but our in the ward, she wasn't raging. You no, know, she was leading the singing, as I recall, in, in Relief Society, and everyone liked her. But the bishop, she started telling me a few stories about the bishop and the state president. What you know, and there were dis disparities. I mean, I don't know if everything she told me is exactly the way it was, but I know that some of the things they said are not what they said. You know, so that disturbed me to see the duplicity, particularly from the state president. I would say, but. Um, I don't know, for some reason, after all these years, I thought, if, if I can't agitate 
for women. If I can't do that, I, I got away with it in the ERA time. I got away with it in other times where I thought maybe I was going too far and I'd get in trouble and I didn't. But in this case, I just felt that I'd had it. And I remembered Algie Balif, who I don't know if you've heard her name, but she was the famous um, Alice Louise Reynolds club. Her husband had been a judge in Provo. When I knew her, she was an old blind lady, wonderful wise lady, Esther Peterson's sister. And Algie said to me, Nancy, when you're old, don't regret that you were scared, too scared to do what you needed to do. So it wasn't like go out and do stuff. It was like, don't, don't be a boob, don't be a baby. And I thought, do I want to die and not have made the steps that I know are right? So I wrote a letter to the bishop. Well, and one more thing I want to say, too. We went to a Mormon History Association meeting that, that right about that same time. In fact, it ended just before Kate got exed. And Mormon History Association has, you know who, the Bushmans and, and how, I can't even Jack name. Ships. Yeah, she, all these intelligent people who are um, intellectual but tr faithful in the church and so on. And we had several panels on the ordained women group, on women and women's role and the history of the Relief Society. And I actually said to the bishop later, how can we go to one group and we talk about it openly and nobody feels threatened? And then we go to sacrament meeting and we can't talk about it and, and our actual, you know, everything we do in the church is now suddenly under um, in danger. And I said, I just think that is so astonishing to me that we can't model ourselves. What, what's the damage done if we have a panel discussion or we talk about these things? Anyway, that, that upset me a great deal. So I wrote a letter to him and just basically resigned my callings and resigned. I didn't... I after Kate was excommunicated? After Kate was excommunicated. So that upset you? Yes, and one more thing about that, I guess, is that many people came to support her, and I live pretty close to the church back there, and so the night that she was exed, we had a large group come to my house, and I didn't know all of them, a lot of young women from around the country, not just local, who were really upset, and so it wasn't just Kate, it was the feeling of, now I'm the older generation, there where I was a long time ago on the ERA, now it's kind of revisiting, uh, you know, are we going to stand up for things or not? And I admired the Ordain Women webpage. I think it's, it's nice. It's um, positive, and it just shows a lot of women wanting to experience the priesthood. So it didn't matter to me. A lot of people say, well, why did you care if you don't even believe in the priesthood or you don't even believe that this is special, which is true. But I think women should fight for their rights wherever their rights are violated. <coughs> I don't care what religion or what state or what, you know. So, so I would. I don't want to say that I quit because of Kate. That's not entirely true. But that was definitely a catalyst that week, that month, that made me finally write the letter. The bishop did not answer me, other than to he did text me and say thank you for your thoughtful letter. And, and the gist of your letter was what? That I am. I am no longer going to attend church or hold a church job. I did not resign my membership. In fact, I value my membership in a social sort of way. And I said that um, I, I gave about two pages of reasons why I thought he would someday be ashamed of himself because he had daughters. And I said, I think this is going to, and I reminded him that I had studied ethics, which may be a little arrogant or something, but that studying ethics made it impossible for me to not look at this from the standpoint of all the different uh, ethical ways of, of measuring what was right or wrong. And it's just wrong to treat people like tools, you know. And that You're I, saying the church treats, treats women like tools? Mm hmm Absolutely. I mean, we all know that. Who You know, we, we can carry the ball and do the work and do all sorts of things, but we don't get to reap the theoretical benefits. And, um, and you know, one of the answers I always get from, from people is... Um, Oh, but you'd hate it if you had to do all the priesthood work, too. We do everything as it is. And I think that is so condescending to women. It just really I mean, upsets even me. Even the you Catholics know? announced two weeks ago that they're going <clears> to <throat> uh, now take under advisement making women deacons. Yeah, but that's not going to be a full priesthood thing, so I'm not impressed. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, it has been upsetting to some of my family because there's some confusion. Was I... You know, have I asked my name to be taken off the rolls? Have I asked to be excommunicated? And I haven't, and I, it hasn't been a huge deal. Um, we've got a new bishop since then, 
and the new bishop came over to talk to me about whether I might, was there something they could do to get me to come back to church? And I said, yes, you could give me the priesthood. And <laughs> <laughs> that didn't seem suitable to him. And, that, and we're friends, and we parted that way. And that was sort of the end of the discussion. And I have many friends in the ward who still you know, call me, and they're friendly with me. But um, it certainly wasn't true in my ward anyway that you could talk about it. You know, the, the church kind of said, oh, it's okay to have open discussions about this and nobody's going to be threatened. And of course that's not true. They've been threatened. And I would say that there's at least six or eight women in my ward who felt similarly to me, but they haven't, they wouldn't dare raise their heads. They don't want to be left out. They don't want to quit, you know. So I think it's sad to live under this sort of feeling of uh, threat and endangerment. I think that's sad. But anyway, so what, my family have mostly, I, they, I wouldn't say they've supported it at all, but most of them have been kind to me about it and willing to talk about it a little bit. But I think they see me a little bit as, oh, Nancy, just kind of a little bit radical and <laughs> wants to cause a little trouble. <clears throat> you know, but my sons are proud of me. They wanted it to happen a long time ago. You have four <laughs> sons? Yes. Okay. We have a, a Baptist church near us, and it's called Primitive Baptist Church. And I feel like I need to put primitive on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> you know, just think for a minute. This is a, this is a body of very bright and capable professionals all the way through the church, the rural counties, the urban centers, with all the MBAs and all the PhDs and everything. And, and they use a crude tool called excommunication. And what is excommunication? It's nothing less than go to hell. And it, literally, you are on your own now. We're going to dust off our feet, and you are going to hell. It's 2016. <laughs> That's about as primitive as you can be in a society like this. They can't write an honest letter and just say, your cantankerous behavior is not welcome in our church anymore. We'd appreciate it if you'd quit coming. But go to hell is different. Is, 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 it, is it literally an excommunication any less than that? Or is it the telestial kingdom that they mean to go to? Or do they mean just go on out there into the black hole? Where do you go as a soul for excommunication? Come on, let's get real. It's a superstitious punishment. You well, what, what it really is, is it's a social mark that gives you a scarlet letter <laughs> That's, that makes everyone right. hate you and, and scared of you and want to avoid you. And right. they, but it's also a way to kill you socially. Right. But it's a, That's but it's, what it's really about. But it's, but it's a primitive. I mean, it's, right. it's witches well, of Salem. You, ha you have to believe that, that now you will exude some kind of spirit that endangers other people. And that, that I think, is tremendously well, sad. People you know. ask me all the time, what does it mean to get excommunicated? My Jewish friends tell me that. And they laugh. Do you know you have to cooperate with people who excommunicate you by believing like they believe first and then saying, oh, don't excommunicate me, please, because this is what it means to me. Do they actually think an excommunicated person believes that they are worthless and they're going to hell after they get excommunicated? Well, yeah. They no, they do, it, <laughs> they do it to protect the flock. They think yeah. they're killing the, the wolf in sheep's clothing to protect I the I think it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It is a primitive church. But I know, um, like I'm good friends with Lori Stromberg, and Lori and I agree on this, that many people can't imagine why people like her and me would care because we're not really believers anymore. Anyway, we are getting older. We've got nothing to make this a big deal. Why? And um, especially some friends of Lori's who are really critical of her, like, grow up, go find something else to do with your time. But um, I really admire the fact that that's, that's something that, that's important to her and important to me wherever we sit. You know, the church says, uh, uh, grow where you're planted. Well, this is where we're planted, and where we're planted is a place that isn't fair to women. So, and it's sad to me that women come out of BYU not thinking that it's valuable, thinking that they're proud to say, I'm not a feminist, as if that was something to be proud of. I think, it, I think it's so sad because the women are, they're demeaned and they don't know it. And, and in this modern age, they're not living in Bangladesh or Thailand. They're living here in America and they're being demeaned every day that they go to church, but they don't know it. It's sad. 
And yet that was you for 50, 60 years, mm -hmm. right? That's right. I think you knew it. Well, I, no, I did, I did know it, but, um, but I didn't want to act. I mean, I put off acting as late <laughs> as I possibly could. And if I could, I would go to church more in a social way, if I could, if I felt like I didn't have, you know, to stand up for the principal, because I liked it. You know, I liked being there with the kids and my uh, friends. And I found it repulsive. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I found the same things repulsive you did. I'm just saying, if look, if you look at the church without all the... It wasn't your tribe. About, it was hers. I mean, really. Yeah, no, but I'm not yeah. talking... If you went to the men meetings that I did and the high priests yeah. and the elders, they were so I know, arrogant. but sometimes I look at, like, the ward list in my ward and all the women who trade babysitting for each other and, and give each other help if they, you know, need a new, their washing machine broke. Or, you know, people, do, people are doing good, and sometimes I think it really is a bunch of good people. They help you move. They That's how they get things. you. I That's know. how they keep you, mm -hmm. right? That's true. And it's very painful to say that, but I am not religious. Unlike him, I'm not religious. I'm not... I don't, as Lori says, I don't have the God gene or whatever. And so you're not, God and Jesus are kind of suspended for you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, Omar, what are you believing in these days? You know, um, I, I just think that there is the, the, the goodness of humanity. I do believe in the goodness of humans. I think we're a superior species. I think we have more talent, more brains for good. And when you think about the billions and billions of dollars that we spend making medicines and health care to make humans live better, that it's, a, it's the ultimate charitable act on the part of a society anywhere. So you're a humanist, but what about a theist? I, I have a hard time. I'm, lo I'm going through the 48 lectures of the Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you've seen those. They're about 40 to 35 to 45 minute lectures, 48 lectures. When you see from the creation of 13, 0.8 billion years ago to now, and how evolution happened. It takes a big, big brain to think about a god out there lighting a match and creating the bang and letting it go. But like my Jewish friends, I have a hard time believing that God sat through, you know, to go golfing that day the Holocaust happened. But, but, but. But Nancy's sort of calling you a believer a little bit. He's so a little what bit superstitious, I think. I have faith in humanity, and I don't call myself a humanist. Yeah, but you talk about Jesus a lot. Yeah, I like the teachings of Jesus. Okay, so for you, it's not Son of God resurrected, new, new body, living forever, governing his own world. I take Einstein's definition. If there's a God out there, it's too big an idea for my small brain to understand. That's what he says. I, I don't have the comprehension of it. But and I, I think it's frivolous for a lot of people to get up there and say, I know for certain X, Y, and Z. If, <laughs> if you know that, keep it to yourself. So you're liking Christian ethics. I do like it a lot. But not wed to literalist Christian sort of... I don't know. Maybe I am sometimes. <laughs> See what I mean? He's, I, I, I don't waste a lot of time on it, but I do. The you ethics have... drive me. What? The ethics drive me. But the afterlife and, and resurrection, and you're saying you don't know? I don't know. Maybe a little hope? Yeah, surprise me. But you're open. Yeah. You haven't said, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic. I don't think so. Okay. So you're just kind of open. Yeah, and I, I just, and when people tell me they believe and they know, I say, good for you. <laughs> Keep it up. Run faster. And I think he should take his lead from me because I'm the one who studied philosophy. And You're trying to deconstruct his beliefs. What are you doing? <laughs> I know. What if it makes him happy? Some people should just listen to their wives more. You know? I'll tell you. you so you like self-identify as an atheist or agnostic? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. And you want him to? Why do you want him to agree with oh, you? Well, it's not that. I just, I just chuckle sometimes that he, I think he feels a little bit like God will still strike him down if he says anything. That... I, I am an optimist. <laughs> That's why I'm in business. I believe good things can happen. And you can fulfill all your dreams if you really work hard, but you've got to believe you can do it. Now, you're setting optimism against atheism here as sort of, that's a, is that a false that's, dichotomy? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Does that mean you're a pessimist? Well, She's a realist. I'm the realist. In, in She's the got bunch. excellent judgment. Okay. <laughs> excellent. You guys are a great match. <laughs> no. Well, we are. And um, 
I'll tell you something. We've never had a boring day. Well, except maybe I get a little bored sometimes when he's lecturing. Jeez, I, I bore the hell out of him. <laughs> no, we've never had a, a bad day. We've gotten along beautifully for many, many years. And 50 years. About each other. So quickly, your sons, did they choose belief? As soon as they were grown up, they were out the door. And um, I think I've got one. No, you don't. Uh, Aaron and I. No. There, we, have, we have one or I two that I mean Mormon are... belief, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Not Mormon, but belief. So oh, they all, did they, they serve missions? No. We, no. we asked one, them One too. or two of them are, um, are kindly, they think of the church in kind of a kind way, and if a missionary came by the door, they'd bring him in for a glass of water. Two of them would probably say, I'm not even Mormon, and wouldn't even, you know. All we care pretend. about is that they, they didn't leave home with grudges. And that um, it's our job to do good. And if other, if Mormons come by and it's their job to do good by visiting us, fine. But th but they were a little hostile because um, they picked up on the republicanism early too. As early as ten or twelve, they would complain that the Sunday school teacher um, said something really really negative. Like um, uh, remember they. They thought that uh, civil rights was a communist plot and things like that. This was a congressman that was. A... Yeah, and so our kids would hear some of this stuff at church, and they'd come. So that's probably why, because then we'd criticize the speakers at church and everything. We we were never very good at making it positive. So. It's all right to be Republican <laughs> in the Mormon Church and say right wing things over the pulpit, but it's not all right. I think if you went in there and said. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid is a plan that Jesus designed. You'd, you'd be in trouble. You'd be in deep trouble. So, so your children opted not, once they got 18, they just said? Yeah, I mean, they were graduating. As soon as they basically left home, graduated from high school, they're like, see you later. You know? And were you sad about that? Um, no, I, no, I just, all I said was, don't be hostile. You don't know? be hostile. I mean, all our extended family are active and try to be kind about it. So know? progressive Mormons breed non-Mormons, you're saying, basically. Yeah, you know, I think, I think all of our kids are less active than we are, though. I think it's a trend because... Their generation. Um, I think, yeah. are gone. I think this whole generation is not going to have the easy, simple beliefs that we started out with. I'll tell you how so. we judge how these kids turned out. These four, three of the four have kids, and they are the most loving fathers. Um, this one, the comedian, sends us a video of his child every day. She's a year old about now. Mm -hmm. And the but one they, in New York. Yeah, but they don't teach the kids to say their prayers. No. <laughs> you know, and those simple little things. Two that up in Brooklyn, we take for granted. pictures every day. And when he's with them, I watch them, and one, all of them, and they're just really loving fathers and good uncles. Good, good dads. Would your dad be proud of your sons as fathers? Oh, yeah, yeah. How about your parents? Yeah, I think I think Arab fathers are better. My father tended to be strict and, you know, tell us what to do. Arab fathers are extremely loving with their kids. They Doting. carry him around and take him places. And yeah. he, Omar himself has been the best father you can imagine. He never balked at anything from diapers all the way up to driver's licenses. <laughs> What's the secret to a 50-year marriage? Sense of humor. Yeah, op open discussions, confrontations on a regular basis. You know, like, I don't agree, and here's why. It's always on that tone. I don't agree, and here's why. And usually she's right and I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both, we, we both have, over the years, grown to enjoy the same kinds of conversations and the same kinds of ideas, I guess. But he's, he's a good listener, and um, well, we laugh at the same things. She's safe, so I practice with my ideas, and she shoots them down. I do. And it's, a, it's an understood. If I come at her and I press it, and then she knows what I've hit the limit, and I know when she knows I've hit the limit. <laughs> So uh, talk openly, disagree regularly, have a sense of humor. Yeah. Okay, I'll say one more. Remember what it was like when you were madly in love. Because sometimes there are times in marriage when you're bored with each other a little bit or, or you're mad at them for something they haven't been doing for a month and you aren't hardly speaking. Or sometimes you think the magic's gone or whatever. I think you have to go back every once in a while and say, remember how we couldn't live without each other? I mean, in our days, you couldn't go moving in together. You had to get married, right? You, you, could, you know, and, and the thrill it was when we actually can get married to sleep together and be together in our own little apartment. 
It was the most exciting thing on earth. <laughs> Stop so everyone I the think, jackpot. I think sometimes couples, especially Mormon couples, I know some who marry because it seems church sanctioned. He seems like a fine fellow. He's been on a mission. He fits all the protocols. But where's that passion? Where's that feeling of excitement, you know? So remember that. Remember that. Bring it back at least once in a while. <laughs> all right. Really quickly, uh, Nancy, future of the LDS church. Is it going to keep going strong? Is it going to plateau? Is it going to crash and burn? It's a bit of a hobby to me to follow the decline, and I, it's definitely obviously in some decline. Um, I think the decline might be more serious than it appears on paper because, you know, our membership in the... Europe and Americas are not, it's not good. But I don't think that means it's going to die away. Or if, I think it's going to be a long, slow fade for a long time. And I think religion in general is in a long, slow fade. Do you look back with fondness on your time as a Mormon? Or do you wish you had left a lot earlier? See, I feel like I'm ethnically Mormon. I have, when I, I have a hard time telling people, though. I say, oh, I'm a Mormon. I'm, pr I'm proud to say I'm a Mormon. But then I have to immediately say, well, I'm not really an active Mormon be anymore because uh, it, it has too many bad connotations. I don't want people to think I'm, I think when people hear Mormon, they think racist. They think sexist. sexist they think, homophobic. Yeah, I don't want people <laughs> to think that of me. But at the same time, I, I, can't, I can't forget my pioneers and, you know, what, what they went through to come here. So I'm still a Mormon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm willing to disagree with her on that. The future <laughs> yeah. of the Mormon Church. Okay. I, I'm going to go on a record, and it will be a permanent record, won't it? That the Mormon Church is going to find that there's only one way to survive, and they always do things late. Always. Uh, the black late. They're late on women. They're late on gays, and they will be late on the third world and Africa. Right now, they're they're holding back baptisms of really poor people because they can't sustain their wards. And so there's got to be an endowment somehow that subsidizes these wards to get up and running. I think 50 to 100 years from now, the, the locus, the center of the Mormon church will be in Africa. And it will be millions of people that will join. And those are the people that need it in these poverty-stricken poor countries. And they will give up Europe, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, all the the, the wealthy countries and go to the poor countries. When will that happen? It will start in the next 10 years and just 10 grow. 10 years, okay. We can measure that. We'll still be here. You know, the community, community of Christ is much, you know, much more a dynamic international church than they are a huh. domestic church. Okay. It just feels like domestically they're kind of dying. Yeah. But they're still seeing, maintaining or growing because of work in the third world. Well, so, you, I mean, you go where the bu business is, like a good capitalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the missionaries out where we live are certainly not getting a lot of action. I feel sorry for them because it must be boring now that there's more missionaries and more women, but what do they do with them? I mean, the idea of adding <laughs> women and we're up to 80,000 missionaries and producing the same results, you know, it reminds me of the the guy who loses his contact lens and some guy comes down the sidewalk and bumps into him. He says, what are you doing down on your hands and knees? He says, I'm looking for my contacts. And he says, well, where exactly did you lose them? And he says, down there about a half a block. <laughs> he says, well, why are you up here doing it? And he says, well, this is where the light is. <laughs> the Mormons need to realize the membership baptisms are in Africa and parts of Asia. China hasn't fallen apart, and they're adopting Christianity. Korea is. Russia's just beginning. Of course, they've been atheists so long, they'll never join. Well, There's enough people. I think one thing we'd agree on, the church is not going to grow by um, adhering to these classic values that they think are classic values, which, um, according to Dallin Oaks, you know, are, are freedom of Immutable. religion. and in spite of the fact that they uh, kick other people <laughs> in the butt or went away, you know. I mean, people are different, and, and look how quickly we changed on gays. There wasn't long ago that I was uncomfortable with gay marriage, and the, the, I thought maybe gay rights was good, but maybe not gay marriage. And then, like everybody else, I'd be, you know, we thought about it, and we looked at it, and, and there's been a conversion. And so I, I think that's going to have, I think that's not going to be reversed. And I think the church, if it does exist, is going to have to change. So, so do you have, I, I, do you have suggestions for the, like, let's say you were given the question, 
advise the brethren on how to make the church better, but, but your suggestions have to lead to more people coming to church and more tithing revenue. Do you have suggestions you could give them? Or is it like Saudi Arabia, where if they move, well, they're basically just stuck with the people they have, and maybe the brethren want to move and change, but they know they can't because they have to cater to the, to the base. Is that, is that what's going on? We've got Holland and Oaks and Wickman and Bednar just really wanting to move the church in a progressive direction, but they can't because they, you know, they got the members holding them back. I don't think that's uh, true. I, you know, you don't find silver bullets for their problem, but they ought to have emeritus status at 80 for everybody. No, but I for used apostles, to, I used to everybody, believe it was including prophet. Seven, yeah, okay, yeah. But we used to say, even when we were young, we'd say, well, once the old ones go and the new ones come. But the These old, new ones, Bednar, they're, they're worse than they're the worse. old yeah, ones. They they're, are. Not, they're not yeah. liberal. You the know? church does not ask for counseling and guidance from yeah. below. That They've set up a long time top down, not bottom up. The money is bottom up, but the... They don't pull. If you treated it as a business and you brought in consultants, you know what the consultants would say. They would say, uh, do some good advertising that opens your doors to to more people. And sure, shoot for a higher income base if you want, if you're going to sell a car, if you're going to sell clothes. Um, but there, you can't sell it to educated people this way. It's not going to hold on to the long term. And that would mean changing their ways. And they're I don't ready see to it. do it. I don't think. I, well, I'm not, not saying they're going to do it. I'm saying that would be the only way to keep it functional. This is an ethnic church, and f f for you to be a Mormon, you have to hitch your wagon. Well, nobody has a wagon anymore. We don't do hand carts anymore. We don't dig ditches anymore. Most of these young Mormon kids that are checking out don't like authority-based guidance. I've, I've interviewed every one of these kids in the... And, and Republicans, Pete Jensen, I shouldn't have said his name on. Just a very bright lawyer, capable, what's your beef? And we didn't get to the bottom of it, but this guy's not going to be pushed around. He's too smart. He and his wife are hardworking, beautiful couple, lovely kids. And well, that, her, his dad-in-law is just, you know, a bump on the log. What do, what do you want me to do now, brother? I think that's right, that, w that authority figures in general in America don't go over well. And it's not just the apostles in the church, but their relationships to each other that are so authoritarian. I just don't think that's going to stay for the long run. It's too weird. Yeah, but you can't fix that. That's, that's like going to a dictator in the Middle East and saying, yeah. eh, why don't you take a vacation and let somebody else <laughs> take over? And it's not going to be fixed just by putting women in either, because as we all know, the women that are functioning as in leadership positions now. They'll be worse. Well, they just think like the men. They haven't got any openness to, you know. I don't know what it would take to, ch to it, change no, the attitudes of women. No, but I'll bet you'd agree with this. These guys are money-driven. And when the money dries up, they will change their ways. Because they have to have a really hard knock. And, and I had a, a senior person in the church tell me that tens of millions of dollars have dried up. That wakes them up. But they've got such good investments. Yeah, the investments are offsetting the, the right. decrease in but not the is that tithing. what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be a money issue. And another fellow used the example of um, exit ramp. Yeah, yeah. He said the highways used to be crowded, but now everybody's taking the exit ramp. He felt like the flood going off track was so big. I mean, I don't know, but um, we all know that the activity rate isn't the same as what it. I'll what tell it you what's a bigger ramp. issue. Nancy and Omar don't care. <laughs> you don't dance and you don't care. We, we really, really don't care. We've benefited. I personally have benefited fine up till now. But um, who wants to be lectured to on mediocre goals and aims daily? Really. That's I mean, when they attack gays, what are we supposed to do? Oh, yeah, let's go burn a house down? Is that what you're supposed to do? Or let's go hate them. What's the action? You know, versus we've got to help the poor. Well, do you want that done in school, health care, education? You want children to be modeled? What? But how do you model hatred? How do you model that really seriously? Well, and what, one more thing, too. The, uh, the dumbing down of the transmission of the doctrine 
Uh, Has anybody else noticed that the uh, the ensign uh, is not dense with ideas? That's for sure. It's trees die in vain for the ends, and, and then the church. You know, I mean, obviously we're we're uh, we're in an attitude where we are only using visual and quick little simple ideas in order to try. You know, and people who do convert don't really know everything. They're kind of shocked as they learn. You know, so. Uh, in general, obviously, you can see we have lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so let's end with what each of you believe now. So if you were to give your own testimony today, yours, uh, Nancy, is probably going to be quite secular. Um, what do you stand for now? What do you believe now? And if you were to leave our listeners and even your posterity with sort of what your values and beliefs are today, what would you share? Well, I certainly would not like people to go away thinking that um, we're mocking or condemning or making fun of those who stay in the church and love the church because I can certainly see the many good and beautiful things the church does for people. Um, but I would also suggest that we don't spend all of our time in church activities because life is short and there's so many beautiful things to do and to see and to become and more education to get. And I feel like... Sometimes the church is so overpowering that that's all people do. And then do they really have, do, do they get out of that what they give, the contentment and the joy? I'm not so sure they do. So um, I, I would just say that I wish everybody well. And for me, I'm finding a great deal of happiness without constantly running to a Relief Society meeting. What or, brings you happiness now? Oh, I'm writing uh, history, personal histories from my family. So see, that's kind of church-oriented, genealogy-type things. And, um, you know, organizing all my kids' stuff so that in their lives they can go on. And I, I, we read, we read to each other. We just, life is good. Life so, is good. So you're okay. Happy. You're doing okay. I'm doing great. Your light hasn't gone out. No. Your countenance hasn't do, downgraded. Do I seem shiny? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you miss the garments? That's one thing I will never miss. <laughs> and I think they also make women feel body degradation that they shouldn't. And I think they're silly. So. <laughs> when they excommunicated me, they said, you're no longer allowed to pay tithing or, or wear your garments. And oh, said, so sad. <laughs> oh, you're really making me sad. Omar, what do you believe? I have become a fierce secularist. Okay. And I believe that everyone in America needs to be thinking about how to save America from churches. And secularism, the founding fathers talked about deity, they talked about religion, talked about freedom of religion, but they did not say that there was a co-relationship between government and church and state. And the churches have encroached on government so much that I consider it a, a disease in America. There's too damn much religion in government. There are too many congressmen and senators who get up and pray all day on their rami umptums and just go on and on and on about God save America and everything else. The thing that's going to destroy America are the churches. It's doing more to America damage than communism or atheism. Well. Okay. <laughs> and what do you believe in now? And I don't mean spiritually or religiously, just what are the values or the principles that govern your life? I, I've been reading a lot of uh, Gordon Wood, uh, early American historian, about what is the character of the American. And he gives about 10 to 15 attributes of hard work, honesty, religious. Religion is a part of it, but it's part of other things. And I'm trying to capture what the Founding Fathers wanted captured in the, in the, the fundamentals of an American. And as you go through the 14 volumes of uh, Paige Smith from the University of Virginia that wrote The History of America, I think it's page, uh, volume two, first chapter, he says, mm -hmm. the, the American is fundamentally religious. I believe that. And I think it's good that people do it in the old-fashioned way, the humble way. Go home and pray in your own closet and tear down these ugly yellow brick buildings. And I don't mean tear them down, but you don't need to be there to worship. Worship in your homes. But I believe in the goodness of the fundamentals of Americanism. I believe in Americanism. That, and I believe that we are an exceptional 
country, not superior, just exceptional, in that we believe in freedom and liberty and capitalism. And it's, uh, it's the greatest country in the world to live in. The church doesn't hold a candle to America. And, and, and I think that, that the Mormon church would like all members of the church to think that the church is more important than America. The Mormon church wouldn't exist without America. And I think that there's too many people wiping their feet on the flag and the churches are there doing it. Sorry. <laughs> Did I bore you? No, you're just making me laugh, but that's good. Bear your testimony to America. All right. Well, uh, this has been a wonderful, for me, honor and a privilege to meet you both, uh, Nancy Thank and you. Omar. You guys are brilliant and thoughtful and sensitive and wise and fun. And I've had a ball. So uh, please join us at mormonstories.org. Comments there if you want to share constructive or positive or respectfully critical comments. Uh, no mean-spiritedness, please. We want to thank uh, everyone who supports Mormon Stories. Your donations make all this possible. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations uh, are tax deductible. And 100% of what you give goes to making these podcasts and to creating content and resources and information and community to help transitioning Mormons uh, find a way to either become unorthodox in a happy way or to leave the church in a healthy, happy way. So uh, if you're willing, please support us by going to one of our various podcasts, right-hand corner, pick an amount that you're able to contribute monthly, and please contribute to us monthly, and we'll keep doing this as long as you're willing to support us. We're thankful to everyone who made this possible, and uh, we hope you'll join us again for more interesting episodes. So Omar and Nancy, bless you guys, and thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you for having us. We really had a good time. <laughs>